Hello, my name is Dariet Mouline, and I'm here to present on the hidden treasures from the Thomas Kane collections of Ethiopian manuscripts. Before I begin my presentation, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Library of Congress and the Lilly Scholar Resident Program. It was this residency program that enabled me to catalog the Kane collection housed at the Library of Congress. I also want to extend my appreciation to Dr. Lenisa Kishner, Dr. Edward Miner, Fantaun Turuna, and Dr. Krista Johnson, all of whom have made this project possible. I especially want to highlight Fantahun, who has been a great mentor and friend, and I'm truly thankful for all the support he's provided me. This presentation aims to highlight the discoveries made during my time as a Lilly Scholar resident. I'll commence by delivering an introduction that highlights the significance of a project like this within the realm of Ethiopic studies. Subsequently, I'll provide an overview of Ethiopia's history to contextualize our discussion, emphasizing only the relevant historical events for this presentation. Following that, I'll provide a brief explanation of the Ethiopic manuscript tradition. Afterward, I'll offer a concise overview of Kane's collection and spotlight some of the distinctive manuscript discoveries, including the remarkable magical texts. Finally, I'll present a concluding section containing key points for reflection. Introduction. Recently, there has been a growing interest in Ethiopian manuscripts. Each text serves as a testament to the rich culture, language, and history of Ethiopia. However, these texts have remained understudied, particularly in the West, largely due to linguistic limitations. The majority of the texts are written in Ge'ez, the ancient language of Ethiopia, with a few exceptions in Amharic and Tigrinya. It is worth noting that those who possess a strong command of the Ge'ez language are primarily non-European individuals, which makes it challenging for them to publish their findings in Western-led journals. Conversely, Western scholars with the required linguistic expertise to examine Ge'ez manuscripts are few. In addition to language, limited accessibility to the manuscripts has been a major obstacle for Western scholars. Most researchers lack the funds to travel regularly to Ethiopia for a text examination. For several decades, they've had to rely on the scarce resources discovered by expeditions to Ethiopia. However, in recent decades, there's been a surge in the number of Ethiopian manuscripts, particularly in the United States. This increase in the quantity of manuscripts in North America has generated a greater interest in Ethiopian manuscripts. Among the five largest collections of Ethiopian manuscripts in the United States, the Library of Congress is one of them. With over 200 manuscripts, the Library of Congress is at the forefront of Ethiopic manuscript preservation. Moreover, among these five significant repositories of Ethiopian manuscripts, the Library of Congress stands alone as the only institution that is not a university. Nevertheless, due to the limitations, namely language and accessibility, the Ethiopian manuscripts have been a hidden treasure. Thanks to the Lilly Scholar Resident Program, I had the opportunity to catalog and identify the manuscripts housed at the Library of Congress. Throughout my residency, I successfully identified a wide range of texts, including prayer books and magical texts. In this presentation, I aim to share some of the remarkable discoveries I made during my research. History of Ethiopia. Before delving into a discussion about the collections, it is essential to provide some background on the history of Ethiopia. Due to the scope of this paper, an extensive historical account is not possible. Therefore, only relevant sections of Ethiopia's history that contribute to a better understanding of Kane's collection will be presented. Little is known about Ethiopia prior to the Aksumite Empire at the turn of the first millennium. Nevertheless, Ethiopian tradition traces its roots back to the biblical times when the Queen of Sheba is believed to have visited King Solomon. According to the famous book of Kurenagast, the queen is said to have borne a child named Minilik from an encounter with the king. It is believed that their son later brought the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia. 
On the other hand, Western scholars contend that monotheism, along with Christianity, was introduced to the region in the middle of the fourth century during the reign of King Izana. This claim is supported by archaeological discoveries of Aksumite coins, which include some with pagan symbols, inscriptions confessing beliefs in a monotheistic God, and inscriptions affirming faith in Jesus Christ. All of these coins are attributed to King Izana, and this suggests an era of conversion, both for the king and the region. Islam is believed to have reached Ethiopia during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. According to Islamic texts, at the height of Muslim persecution, the Prophet's followers sought refuge in Ethiopia under the reign of Emperor Armah, also known as Najashi. In Ethiopian Islamic tradition, the emperor is said to have converted to Islam after being taught by the immigrants. As Islam spread across the globe, the Aksum Empire began to decline. Following the decline of Aksum, the Zagwe dynasty took over at the turn of the second millennium. However, much like the era before Aksum, little is known about this dynasty. It is perhaps known for the rock-hewn churches located in present-day Lalibela, named after one of the kings in the dynasty. Tradition states that the Zagwe rulers were from a separate ethnic group that did not have the rightful claim to the throne. According to the Kabernagast, the kings of the region must be descendants of King Solomon. Since the Zagwe rulers were from a different ethnicity, they did not meet this criterion and there was a need for someone from Solomon's lineage to reclaim the throne. In 1270 AD, Yukunno Amalak is said to have reclaimed the throne and established the so-called Solomonic dynasty. Although the dynasty was established, it was not until the 14th century under Amdetsion I that the empire experienced significant expansion. It was also during this period that there was a sudden surge in monasteries, which became hubs for Christian education, or were often generously funded by the locals of the region. In the 15th century, the Christian church underwent a major reformation led by Emperor Zerialko. The emperor's decree to include selected Christian texts in liturgical services ensured the continuous production of manuscripts into the modern era. As a result, a diverse array of Christian texts, which may have been lost in other traditions, can be discovered in Ethiopia. Manuscript Tradition It is this interwoven history that Ethiopian manuscripts bear witness to. The texts project ideas that reflect the social fabric of the time. A wide range of genres can be found within the tradition, including historical, philosophical, poetical, and theological works, although the majority fall under the umbrella of Christian texts. The manuscript tradition can be traced back to the Aksumite Empire. The earliest known manuscript found in the Abagarima Gospels is believed to have been compiled as early as the 6th century AD, making it one of the oldest fully illuminated gospels in the world. Nonetheless, the majority of Ethiopian manuscripts that have been studied are dated from the 15th century onward, with very few exceptions. Traditional Ethiopian manuscripts, known as branna, are made from parchments, while modern-day manuscripts may use paper. A group of parchments, referred to as a choir, is often bound together with a string. These choirs are then combined, usually with a wooden cover, to create a complete manuscript. However, scrolls, which are single-paged and mostly used for magical texts, do not undergo this binding procedure. Instead, they are designed to roll up and down in a vertical fashion. Manuscripts crafted for personal use encompass a variety of categories, including devotional texts. These frequently include excerpts from the Bible, as well as magical texts intended for recitation by the faithful to invoke protection or healing. Additionally, there are liturgical texts primarily designed to assist clergy members who struggle to memorize prayers during services. The distinction between liturgical texts composed for personal use and those for communal worship lies in the latter's intended utilization by any member of the local church community during services, while the personal text is meant for an individual owner. 
Often, the contents consist of prayers or hymns that clergy members are expected to have memorized. Within the domain of magical texts, there exists a subset designed to be worn around the neck for protective purposes. A noteworthy feature of these texts is their considerably small size when compared to other manuscript types. Regarding the ink, a combination of indigenous plants is mixed to produce the desired colors. The most commonly utilized color is black, serving as the base text. Red ink is often used in Christian texts for writing names of God and saints. Additionally, other colors are used as decorative elements at the beginning of a text to signify a new section. The tradition also incorporates various colorful paintings of religious figures with an emphasis on green, yellow, and red colors. Overview of Kane's Collection. Kane's Collection, named after Thomas L. Kane, consists of both parchments and paper manuscripts. A significant portion of the collection consists of paper manuscripts, alluding to modern texts from the mid 20th century. Interestingly, there does not appear to be any manuscripts older than the 19th century. Notably, nearly all the paper manuscripts are magic texts, which belong to a genre of Ethiopic manuscripts invoking secret names of both the divine and demons. This is of particular interest since a vast majority of Ethiopian manuscripts and other collections are often prayer books in the form of Psalters and Canticles. As will be discussed, the presence of this disproportional number of magical texts raises interesting questions about the patron of these manuscripts. Most of the manuscripts in these collections are small in size, meant to be handheld, which contrasts with the few larger manuscripts within the collection. Essentially, they serve as service books to be used as a reference or guide during church services. On the other hand, the smaller handheld manuscripts are meant for personal use, often consisting of private prayers or liturgical hymns meant to be chanted in a congregation. The liturgical manuscripts can be seen as guides for the faithful who are unable to memorize the chants. Some manuscripts share unique features with each other, most notably the decorative elements known as hareg in the texts. These decorative elements are often included at the beginning of a new section of the manuscripts, containing elaborate ornaments with a variety of colors. Generally, these decorative colors are distinctive of certain regions and times. There are no set rules for how the ornament, the folios, yet a group of the manuscripts within the collection contain identical decorative elements, suggesting that these manuscripts were collected from the same location. The modern nature of the manuscripts, coupled with their small sides and similar decorative patterns, presents an interesting question regarding Kane's collection. Specifically, for what purposes were these manuscripts collected? Moreover, who is the patron of these manuscripts? Fanta Huntrune, Library of Congress Ethiopian specialist, has noted that Kane, being a linguist, likely gathered these texts to help him compose a Ge'ez and Amharic lexicon. This is further substantiated by the large presence of magical texts, which often include a wide range of vocabulary that may assist someone seeking to compose a lexicon. The similar decorative patterns found in the modern day paper manuscripts also suggest Cain to be the patron of these texts. That is, these texts may have been commissioned exclusively for Cain's use and may never have been utilized in the Ethiopian traditional setting. Unique discoveries. Kane's collection comprises remarkable manuscripts, one of which is ID 48. This manuscript features an image that bears a striking resemblance to the painting of Our Lady of Guadalupe, originating in Mexico during the 16th century. The intriguing aspect is how this image ended up in an Ethiopian manuscript Despite the widespread dissemination of the Guadalupe painting worldwide, its presence in an Ethiopian manuscript remains captivating. The Ethiopian manuscript tradition continues to thrive with painters maintaining the traditional artistic style, giving an authentic Ethiopian touch to the image. As discussed earlier, 
The traditional Ethiopian artistic style involves the use of green, yellow, and red as primary colors in the drawings. However, as shown in this figure, the yellow and red colors are notably absent in this rendition. Moreover, the stance of the Virgin Mary with her hands clasped together and facing downward is not characteristic of Ethiopian manuscripts. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that the painter responsible for this drawing may not have received formal training in the Ethiopian tradition. Considering that the manuscript likely dates from the mid 20th century, it is plausible that the painter encountered a printed image of Our Lady of Guadalupe and was inspired to create their rendition. In addition to the content revealed in the main text, the information discovered in the preliminary pages is fascinating. Examples of such cases can be found in ID 72 and ID 85. In the first case, the primary page contains a series of mathematical problems that seem to have been solved by a student. The correct answers are marked with red ink, indicating the student's success. These exercises are exclusively present on the initial pages of the manuscript and are not related to the main content of the text in any way. ID 85 stands out as an anomaly due to its unexpected content in the preliminary pages. As depicted in this figure, the folio comprises three columns of a series of words. The first column presents the transliteration of the English words found in column two, while the third column provides the translation of those English words. Examples found in the preliminary pages of these manuscripts offer fascinating insights into their lifespan. Without further information, it is impossible to determine if these preliminary pages were filled with content before, during, or after writing the main content in the preceding pages. Additionally, it is challenging to ascertain whether the content in these preliminary pages was included by the scribe himself or a different individual. Nevertheless, we can infer that during the life cycle of these manuscripts, their owner likely resided in the city which exposed him to modern day education. Furthermore, the presence of red ink suggests that the owner received personal assistance in his learning. The set of English words hints at a Western influence for the personal assistance, possibly Thomas Kane himself. If Kane was indeed the guide for the owner's education, then it is likely that these manuscripts were commissioned on his behalf. In addition to a monetary reward, he might have promised to assist the owner in his quest to earning a modern education if he was willing to prepare these texts for him. ID 98 is another intriguing manuscript. The text appears to be a collection of traditional poetry known as Kene which is a significant subject taught under the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Kene is typically presented in a public setting and is exclusively performed orally. The presence of Kene in written form suggests that the owner of the text was likely a student seeking to learn this poetic form. The Kene itself appears to have been presented by a scholar within the church, revealing a level of mastery and expertise that a student likely would not have possessed. In addition to shedding light on the Ethiopian tradition, the Kane collections provide a window into indigenous society in the middle of the 20th century. The inclusion of mathematical questions, along with elementary English vocabulary lists, indicate a desire among Ethiopians to gain a modern education. The mid to late 20th century was a volatile period for Ethiopians, with the overthrow of the imperial system leading to a crossroad for how to govern the nation. Many felt that the traditional teachings of Ethiopian Orthodoxy were outdated and the call for modernity emerged. These manuscripts appear to capture a snapshot of this transformation in the region. Magical texts. The Cain collections encompass a wide range of genres from biblical to hagiographical texts. However, arguably, 
The most intriguing manuscripts are the magical texts, also known as Asmat prayers. These books are dedicated to invoking hidden names of the divine, both holy and demonic, with the hope of fulfilling specific requests. These requests can vary from healing to gaining powers that inspire affection in others towards the person performing the prayer. What makes these particular texts noteworthy is that a significant number of them begin with the Christian formula in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Surprisingly, some of these texts also appeal to Satan himself, as seen in the case of ID80. This might be a manifestation of cross-pollination of faiths, a phenomenon widely observed across the continent. The Igbo people in the West Africa, for instance, have blended their ancestors' faith with Christianity as a way to resist the imposition of Western religion during colonization. This blending gave rise to the hybrid form of practice prevalent in West Africa. Similarly, in Ethiopia, Despite Christianity becoming a state religion in the fourth century, proselytization of the people was not an immediate concern both for the state and the church until the middle of the second millennium. As a result, locals likely had the opportunity to observe Christian rituals while maintaining their ancestral practices. The magical texts discovered could be evidence of this historical reality. Among the magical texts, ID 68, which invokes protection against thieves, stands out. In the Giz language, it begins with the Christian formula, but then switches to Arabic. Using the Giz alphabet, and invokes the Islamic formula, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of the most merciful and compassionate God. The text even goes to invoke the name of the Prophet Muhammad. This blending of Christian and Islamic prayer formulas challenges the Western understanding of the society. Western scholars often portray Christians and Muslims as a monolithic societies, constantly at odds with each other. However, texts like ID 68 indicate the existence of Ethiopians who see themselves as a crossbreed of these two faiths. Regions like Shoah are known examples of such communities where Christians and Muslims intermarry leading to a society that challenges conventional notion of religious identity in Ethiopia. Conclusion. Kane's collections present us with a unique opportunity to delve into the diverse textual traditions that thrive in Ethiopia. Within this selection, although dating back to the mid 20th century, one can perceive echoes of a tradition stretching back several centuries. Notably, the extensive compendium of magical texts within these collections provides scholars with a substantial data set invaluable for their scholarly appraisals of this particular genre. This critical examination of these texts by historians promises to unveil a richer comprehension of Ethiopian culture and its intricate societal dynamics. And yet, these collections challenge conventional paradigms associated with the study of Ethiopian literature. Despite the prevalent dominance of Psalters and other Ethiopian manuscripts collections, Cain's compendium predominantly consists of magical texts. As mentioned earlier, the significant presence of magical texts, renowned for their utilization of a wide array of vocabulary words, may be attributed to Cain's pursuit of specific texts that would aid him in creating a giz in Amharic lexicon. Nevertheless, this incongruity prompts us to ponder whether these collection faithfully represents the full spectrum of genres existing within the Ethiopian manuscript tradition. Interwoven with this notion is the plausible scenario that Cain might have commissioned these manuscripts for his personal research. In other words, Cain's approach to acquiring manuscripts had the adverse effect of leading Ethiopian scribes to exclusively copy these manuscripts for Cain's research. This stands in contrast to the traditional practice of manuscript production. Throughout history, Ethiopians crafted manuscripts to serve their local communities. Yet this instance appears to deviate from this customary practice. 
While every culture naturally evolves in response to its environment, the catalyst for such change should not stem from scholars who seek to inspect African societies driven by personal motives. If indeed this holds true, it hints at a concern in the manuscript production tradition influenced by Western forces. In conclusion, Kane's collection stands as a doorway to uncover the diversity of Ethiopian textual traditions. Their contents, composition, and origins provoke thoughtful contemplation about their representation in the larger context of manuscript collections. Among this, a sensitive awareness of cultural preservation must guide our academic endeavors to ensure a respectful engagement with Ethiopia's multifaceted heritage.